Franklin. Let's stand. Let's worship this morning. Lord, we come before you humbly, and we're here to shout your praise on the mountaintops. We're here to give glory to your name. We're here to praise your name on high. We're here to glorify you, Lord, and we lift your name up on high this morning, God. I pray that as we sing your praises, as we lift your name up, Lord, that you would come and you'd rest heavy in this place, Lord, that we can feel the tangible, tangible weight of your glory this morning, God. We long for more of you, Lord. Come and save us from the nations, God. Lord, your love is good, and it does endure forever, Lord. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Nothing that you shed your blood So I'm gonna live like my shame is gone I won't be shackled to the way I was No, I'm gonna live like my chains are gone Gone Now my sin is dead and gone And I sing hallelujah Oh, done, done he is risen, it is done, and I sing hallelujah. And whoa, 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 whoa. Praise is a weapon. And praise is a weapon that will overcome. So I'm gonna shout like my battle's won. Yeah, fall back, devil, cause your time is up. No, I'm gonna live like the stone is gone, gone. Now my sin is dead and gone, and I sing hallelujah. It's done, done, done. He is risen, it is done, and I sing hallelujah. Sing it again, gone, gone, gone. Now my sin is dead and gone, and I sing hallelujah. Oh, it is done, done. He is risen, it is done, and I sing hallelujah. How great, how great the power of the blood. Whoa. Righteousness of God. Whoa, whoa, how great, how great the power of the blood. Whoa, whoa, I am the righteousness of God. sing hallelujah oh it is done and done and he is risen it is done and i sing hallelujah god god now my sin is dead and gone and i sing hallelujah done and done and it's done and I sing hallelujah and whoa stand here free before you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Hallelujah to our King. And we waited for this day. We're 
gathered in your name and calling out to you. Your glory like a fire awakening desire will burn our hearts with joy. You're the reason. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens, and we want to see it. And open up the floodgates, and a mighty river flowing from your heart, and filling every part I praise. Come fill up our praise. Your presence, your presence in this place, your glory on our Descending like a cloud, you're standing with us now. So, Lord, unveil our eyes. Sing it out, you're the reason. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason. You're the reason we're seeing. Open up the heavens, and we want to see open up the floodgates and a mighty river flowing from your heart and filling every part of our prayers open the heavens open up the heavens and we want to see you and open up the floodgates and a mighty river flowing from your heart Every part of our praise oh, Fill up our praise, God We want to see you, God Come show us your glory, God and Show us, and show us your glory and Show us Show us your power and show us and show us your glory, Lord. Come on, church, let's sing it. Show us your glory. And show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. And show us, show us your glory, Lord. Wanna see you, God? Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Sing it one more time. Show us your glory. Sing it out. Show us, show us your glory. Show us. Show us your power, show us, show us your glory, Lord. And open up the heavens, and we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, and a mighty river flowing from your heart, and filling every part I pray. Open up the heavens, and we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, and a mighty river flowing from your heart, and filling every part of our praise. Come and fill it up our praise, God. We want to see you. Show us your glory, God. We want to see you, God. God, that's our prayer. Lord, that you would open up the floodgates, Lord. Lord, that you would pour out your spirit, Lord. Come and pour it out, Lord. We need more of you. More of your power. More of your presence, God. More of your glory. Come and show us, Lord. Let your fire fall, God. Let your flood fall, Lord. Pour it out. Pour it out. Pour it out. Show us your glory. to you. Show us. Show us your power, 
show us, show us your glory. Just keep singing, show us your glory. And show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory. Sing one more time. Just the voices now. Show us. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory. God, we cry for more of your glory, more of your power, Lord. Lord, I pray that you come, Lord. Come in power, come in glory, Lord. We long for more of you, Lord. Hallelujah. You hear me when I call. You are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. And whom shall I fear? And you crush the enemy And underneath my feet You are my sword and shield Though troubles linger still And whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me I know who stands behind The God of angel armies Is always by my side The one who reigns forever And he is a friend of mine The God of angel armies Is always by my side My strength my strength is in your name and for you alone can save you will deliver me yours is the victory and whom shall i fear whom shall i fear and whom shall i fear and i know who goes before me I know who stands behind The God of angel armies Is always by my side The one who reigns forever He is a friend of mine The God of angel armies Is always by my side Nothing. And nothing formed against me shall stand And you hold the whole world in your hand And I'm holding on to your promises You are faithful, you are faithful Nothing formed against me shall stand You hold the whole world in your hands And I'm holding on to your promises You are faithful You are faithful You are faithful who goes and I know who goes before me I know who stands behind the God of angel armies is always by my side the one who reigns forever he is a friend of mine the God of angel armies is always by my side and I know who goes before me I know who stands behind The God of angel armies Is always by my side The one who reigns forever He is a friend of mine 
the God of angel armies is always by my side. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The God of angel armies is always by my side. Yes, Lord, hallelujah. Lord, we thank you that you can call us friend. That we can be right here in your presence, God. Lord, we long for more of you. Come wrap us in your warm embrace, Lord. Come wrap us up, Lord. As we draw near, come on. I want to be close. And close to your side. So heaven is real, and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above, singing as one to sing it. Oh, my God. 
As we prepare to take the tithes and offerings, I want to continue on this idea of this unusual kingdom that we belong to. It is, it is so foreign to the way that you and I think. It's not like any other kingdom anywhere else. In our kingdom, in the kingdom you and I belong to, we love our enemies. We pray for those who do us wrong. You know, somebody cuts you off in traffic and you tell them they're number one with the wrong finger. Okay, that's not the kingdom. See, in the kingdom, we pray. In the kingdom, we forgive. In the kingdom, we operate differently than the world operates. You want to live forever? In the kingdom, that means you're going to have to die. It means you have to lay down your life. It means you are going to have to put yourself last. And in fact, if you want to be the greatest of all in his kingdom, you're going to have to become servant. You will have to make yourself last to become first because the kingdom is different than the kingdom of the world. It's different to our way of thinking. Do you want to become really strong, powerful? you want to be powerful like he is? You'll find that only in your weakness. When you're weak, then you will find you're truly strong because you've laid down yourself and He is moving through you. It's just It's not how we think. If you want to receive good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, I don't make the rules, but you're going to have to give. That's how it works. Our nature is, is if I want more, I have to, I have to claw and grab and bring in more. I have to guard it and take care of it. And, and that's not how the kingdom works at all. In the kingdom, if you want more, you have to give it away. It's foreign to our thought. I, I, I watch. I can't help myself. I watch as men prepare for the evil day. Say, what are you talking about? Well, just watch the news, watch the TV, watch something. An evil day seems to be upon us, and I'm watching people prepare. They're all preparing in their own way. They're all getting things together. Today, we call them preppers. I'm sure there was a word for them 200 years ago. Today, they're preppers. They're trying to make provision for themselves. What I want you to understand is as you make preparation, 
I, I understand this is a natural thing. Please don't forget. Try to keep in mind the kingdom that you're part of because it prepares in a different way than this kingdom prepares. It just does. You need to remember that giving to the poor is lending to the Lord. Okay, you'll find that in Proverbs 19.17. I didn't just make that up. Giving to the poor is lending to the Lord. Have you ever considered, you know, sometimes I'll loan people money and I'll go, hmm, I wonder if I'm ever going to see that again. Do you suppose it's that way with God? No. No, you lend to God. He will see that you get back. And I will tell you this, his interest rate is exceptional. He pays wonderful interest. Watchmen prepare. And I'd be lying if I told you I wasn't preparing too. I'm juggling things around in my life because I don't like what I see. I realize this world is going the way that the Bible said it was going to go. But in my preparations, I take into account the kingdom of God. It is part of the math I use as I work things out, as I decide what's going to go where and how things are going to be done. I... Keep tithes and offerings part of that mixture. I do. I don't. I don't. That is something that I don't mess with. I don't change that. See, I'm not going to come before the Lord empty handed. Now, I'm not, I'm not asking you to do anything. I'm telling you what I do. Oftentimes people say, well, how did, how did you end up where you're at? If you want to end up where I'm at, you have to do the things I do. I ended up by doing the things God said to do. You know, we, we forget a lot of times that his path, the kingdom path of prosperity, is found in giving. That's no fun, right? I might not have enough. Well, you might have to trust a little, too. People, people get confused about tithes and offerings. And I just, I just want to be clear with you. A tithe is different than an offering. Now, tithing is old covenant. That is, that is a requirement of the old. We're not under that covenant anymore. You still get to go to heaven if you don't tithe. I want, I, right? Tithing is not a requirement. But there are promises in the Bible that God will not forget for tithers. A tither isn't you just bring to God whatever you want. That's the offering. The tithe is very different. I'm not telling you you have to tithe. I'm just saying Pay attention to what's going on around you. God's word does not return void. So as I make my plans, as I recognize the nature of his kingdom is different than the nature of this kingdom, I remember to do things the way of his kingdom because I want his results, not my results. I hope that makes some sense. And I hope you don't feel like I'm, like I'm trying to push, right? I just, I listen to people prepare and, and, and they're doing some odd things to me, right? They're, they're, uh, they're putting a whole bunch of MREs on credit cards. Okay, I'm not sure that's actually financially sound advice. You understand that, that it, there's a, an all likelihood interest rates are going up really soon. Your credit card rates are going up really soon. Your mortgage rates, if you got a very, they're going up soon. I can't fix that. So don't, don't load up your credit card with a bunch of stuff that you're going to hide in your basement. Do, do you understand what I'm telling you? Some nodding would be good. A little nodding would be good. I want you to understand. The kingdom does not do things the way men do things. It does not prepare the way men prepare. So do all the stuff in your heart that you feel like you need to do, but keep the kingdom in mind as you do it because it's different. Jesus, help us to embrace and understand the kingdom. Father, help us to be, Father, hilarious givers. Help us, Father, to be men who aren't tied to the things of the world, but, Father, tied to the things of the kingdom. Father, I pray now over the finances of the people here today. Father, I pray over the finances of the people who will hear this over the Internet. Father, I pray that you would eradicate debt in their lives. Remove it from them in Jesus' name. 
Father, where debt has become a problem, I pray, Father, you would release them in Jesus' name. I pray, Father, this people would be a people of all sufficiency in all things, that they could be a blessing on every occasion. Father, I pray that you would give them enough, Father, so they could always have something to give. In Jesus' name, amen. And I have to say this, there's new faith. I just want, I'm not after your money. I'm not fishing for your money. I'm really, really not. But I know that the hour is going to come when people will have stored up all the wrong things. And they'll go, you know what we should have done? We should have given. That's what we should have done. We'd have been better off if we'd have given. Praise the Lord. I have to tell you, I... <clears throat> Every so often I struggle over messages. This particular message has been, it's just been a mess. And, and so I don't know what to tell you. We're just going to see what God does this morning. I'm going to turn to Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. I sense this morning that the devil does not want me to share these things with you. I have, I have struggled over the last couple of days in ways that aren't typical for me. And even as I'm trying to put thoughts together and make them clear, I find they're not clear, and so I'm going to need the Lord's help this morning. You're all familiar with this verse. You might not know where it is, but you're all familiar with it. You might recall that Jesus has spending time with the disciples, and disciples have come to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. You know, John taught his disciples to pray. You ought to be, could you like throw us a bone, teach us how to pray too? Because we, we're, we're looking thin here. And what we're going to read is in the middle of what he taught them to read. This is, of course, what today we call the Lord's Prayer. And that's why I say you all know it by heart or you can stumble your way through it if nothing else. In verse 13, though, he, he teaches them something that, that causes me pause teaches them to pray this, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. All right, let's pray. Father, I ask you today humbly to help me to share the word you have with your people. Father, I pray you'd help me just to step out of the road, Father, and, and share life with them. I pray, Father, by your spirit you would move and give them ears to hear and eyes to see. Father, and hearts to receive in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, for me, I love passages like this. I love passages that when you read them, at first glance, they sort of seem to be at odds with everything you know about God. This passage seems to me to be at odds with what I know about God. Is it the nature of our God to lead us into temptation? Is that who he is? So why are we praying, don't lead us into temptation? And why would Jesus say, this is a good, this is how you should pray? I just have to say, that seems very odd to me. The reason I love passages like this is because if you'll take the time to dig into them, if you'll take the time to take them apart, You'll find truth in them that you hadn't seen before. You'll find a depth of truth that's wonderful. And sometimes what you'll find is it's just a function of how the translation got handled from Greek to English. Sometimes what you'll find is double entendres of words, words with multiple meanings. And Sometimes what you'll find is understandings of the way language was handled back then, and it's not handled that way now. It doesn't, doesn't carry over is what I'm saying. For example, I might say, hey, that's really cool. Well, do I mean it's cold? Do I mean it's bad? But do I mean bad as in not good or bad as in cool, but not cold? Do you understand what I'm saying? Language changes over time. So why would Jesus teach his disciples to pray, Father, lead us not into temptation? I think with some examination, the the answer becomes a little bit more clear. And I think it's important for us to understand this because in this is the nature of God that you and I need to understand. 
He does not lead us into temptation. Here's the thing. Jesus created all things, created men. And because he created men, he knows what's in a man. He knows the nature that's in a man. He knows our potential for greatness and our potential to stumble easily. In fact, because he came to earth and he lived as a man and he struggled as a man, it makes him actually a wonderful high priest because he doesn't have to just guess what it's like. He's actually been through it. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says this, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness. That high priest is Jesus, of course. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Knowing how easily we can be led astray, then, Jesus teaches his disciples in this passage to ask for God's mercy. See, we just the things of life can cause temptation. And I'm, I'm thinking, how can I bring this out to you in a way that makes sense to you? And I, I want to try to give you an example of life. And this is the best I could do. If you come up with a better one, I'd love to hear it because I want it to be clear, but analogies break down at some point. And have, you ever, have you ever taken a young child to the grocery store and gotten tangled up in the line to pay out? Because there's candy on either side, and there's toys. And they're not up high, they're down low. Whose brilliant idea was that? I have to wonder, how did that seem good to anybody? And yet, we know it seems good to grocers. Maybe you don't have kids. Even if you don't have kids, you have watched this dance happen over and over and over. Mom shudders and she brings the kids up and, ooh, can I have this? No. Oh, but please, I'll be good. No, no, we aren't going to have that now. Oh, man. Finally, the no comes. You never get me nothing. Okay, so what's happened now is mom feels bad. The child's struggling, frustrated, disappointed. Everybody in line is sympathizing, and this whole thing could have been avoided if they just put the candy where it belonged, in the candy aisle. But, of course, they don't do that because there's more money in putting the candy up front. That's not my point today. The point I want you to grab is, you and I, we all suffer temptations. All of us do. And if you say, I don't, well, you're just lying to yourself or somebody else. We all suffer temptation. A good parent will often restructure even their plans, if need be, to avoid taking their kids through temptation. For example, I can't stop going through the checkout without going to jail, so we're going to have to go through that. But I can tell you one aisle that my little kids, I never took them through. We avoided that aisle at all costs. It was that crazy aisle that has a few greeting cards at the end, and otherwise it was wall-to-wall -wall candy. We didn't go down that aisle. You know why I didn't go down that aisle? I didn't want to put my kids through that. I didn't want to put myself through that. I didn't want to put all the people at the grocery through that. It was more logical for me to simply avoid the aisle. Now, Young kids will eventually learn how to handle that little two-foot section of candy up front with training. But it becomes too much of a temptation to bring them down the whole aisle. Does that make sense to you? There were times, of course, with our kids when... I needed to get Bev a birthday card or greeting card for something. Well, guess where they put those cards? Down the candy aisle. You know, and so sometimes what I think is, you know what? I get that later. I don't need to get it now because I don't need to put them through it, and I don't need to put me through it. 
I want you to understand, this is what Jesus is teaching people to pray. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. He's not saying God's a big old meanie, and we need to pray that he will protect us from his own meanness. And when I say it like that, it kind of sounds stupid, doesn't it? What he's saying is, Father, remember, we are weak. Remember our weakness. Children have a tendency to follow their parents pretty much wherever they go. So God, if it turns out you need a greeting card this morning, could you take me the back way around? Could we go by the meat section and come up that way? I won't be tempted in the meat section. But if you take me down the candy aisle, I may struggle. Hope you see the picture there. It's a prayer of recognition that I'm weak. I'm weak. And I need his strength in my life. I'm in need of his deliverance. It's not a prayer for God to be nice. He's already nice. It's a prayer for him to remember that I I need help. And I like the way the message translation happens to handle this particular passage. It just says this. It says, keep us safe from ourselves and from the evil one. Well, that makes a lot more sense to me. See, if by now you haven't learned, I'll let you in on a secret. The Christian life is not a destination. It's a journey. You'll never get there. Well, one day you will. You're going to have to leave this plane, though. See, it's always going to be a process, line upon line, precept upon precept, learning upon learning and doing upon doing, constantly moving from grace to grace and constantly moving from glory to glory and constantly having to put that old man, that old ugly nature back on the cross. Constantly. He just like won't stay there. That old nature is the nature you were delivered from. It belongs on the cross. Like I said, over time, children will grow up and, and you'll soon be able to take them down the checkout aisle without too much trouble. Because the candy won't tempt them like it used to. At some point in their life, well, you all did, well, most of you did, I can't say for sure. Most of you mastered the candy aisle by now, and you can walk right down the front and get that greeting card because you don't have to stop and get a whole cart to load it up with candy before you leave. You're not a slave to it anymore. But there might still be in your life aisles that you don't go down because they provide too much temptation for you. And you realize it's just better for me not to go down that aisle. Maybe, maybe for you, that's the alcohol aisle. Maybe that's the aisle you think, you know what? I'm better off. I just don't go down that. Maybe maybe it's the tobacco aisle. Maybe, maybe it's the magazine section that poses troubles for you. Maybe it's worse than that. Maybe, maybe it's not the grocery store at all that causes you trouble. Maybe it's the adult bookstore that causes you trouble. Or maybe your own home computer. What I'm speaking of now, see, there's temptation, but there's also arenas in our lives where if you are to enter that arena of battle, you know you're going to lose. If I take that drink, I'm going to lose. If I smoke the cigarette, I'm going to lose. If I open the magazine, I'm going to lose. For the alcoholic, he knows to take another drink is, is serious failure. And so to find himself in the alcohol section at the fries indicates how far, how dangerous he's already come and how close failure already is. Now, I don't know if you caught, I made a slight jump as I was talking about our grocery store scenarios. In the initial scenarios, I was talking about the father leading the child into the grocery store. But now we're not talking about anybody doing any leading anymore. You're in there on your own. You've 
come of your own. And you're wandering through the grocery on your own. This is why Jesus says, lead us not to temptation. God's nature has never been to lead his people into temptation. But we have to remember that as we grow up and we find victory over the little candy row in the checkout aisle, we still may not have victory over the candy aisle. Or maybe we have victory over the candy aisle, but the alcohol aisle, that I don't have victory there. What I want you to remember is no man is immune to temptation. James says it this way, chapter 1, verse 13. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. I mean, it's pretty straightforward right there. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Now listen. Then, after desire has conceived... It will give birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, will give birth to death. As we grow up in the Lord, oftentimes Christians find areas in their life where they still seem to be slaves. And they find this odd. It's like, I thought Jesus freed me. In some areas of my life, I was freed immediately. But, but there's this one area of my life, I'm just not free. I know I'm not free. And I know I'm not free because every time it comes up, I will submit to the command. The master in that area leads me and I'll just say yes, whatever it is. Because I'm helpless to do otherwise. Don't you think we should have a cigarette? You really want a cigarette. You know I really do want a cigarette. I'm struggling now. I'll tell you another secret. You want to know how weak you are? You won't know for sure until you try to be strong. You will find out just how desperately weak and how much in need of help you actually are. The Bible calls these areas in our lives where we struggle with victory, the Bible calls them strongholds. And I want you to know, they're not typical areas of sin. They're different than that. They're areas that have not come fully under the Lordship of Christ. Now, he's your saver, he's your protector, he's your healer. But in this one area of your life, he is not seated as Lord. He is the Lord, but in this one area, he just didn't seat it there. Something else rules in that place. Hope you can understand now. Jesus said he came to set the captives free. That's why he came, to make you free. We were all captives. Every one of us was captive. But he came, and he bought us at a price. He paid a price for us. We were slaves, went on the auction block, and he bought us. And after paying the price, we are now slaves to him and to him alone. That means that you're no longer required to obey the old master. You're not required to. Yet, for some odd reason, I find in some areas I just can't seem to help myself. I still bow to the old master. If you're a Star Trek fan, right? Remember the Borg, resistance is futile. Sometimes I feel like resistance is futile. It just doesn't seem like anything I do. That's a stronghold. For whatever reason, it's, it's an area of your life that has not been given over fully to the Lord. And the reason I bring this up today, it seems like an odd thing to bring up. But you need to understand where we are in history. The time of Elijah is coming. In fact, I dare say it's at hand. And if you don't know what the spirit of Elijah is, it's the spirit of repentance. See, Elijah always comes. The spirit of repentance always comes before a move like this. The Bible says, uh, 
that he would precede the coming of Messiah, because if he didn't, God would strike the land. The time of Elijah is at hand, and you're going to begin to see a lot of repentance. In your own life, you're probably going to see a lot of repentance. Revival and repentance, according to Scripture, is going to begin at the house of God. That means we're going to get firsties. And that's typically not fun. And strongholds are so different than any other kind of sin. They hold you captive, and and they aren't. You don't get released from them quite as easily as you do other things. You know, some things it's just, phew, it's gone. Thank you, Jesus. And other things, there's longer periods of struggle. And if I don't take time to explain them, and if you don't understand what they are, then then when this hour comes, and repentance comes, and and everybody's getting free, and you find yourself still struggling in an area, what'll happen is you're going to get condemned. You're going to start thinking Jesus doesn't love you. You're going to start thinking he doesn't care about you. Maybe I'm not even saved. Do you understand how this goes? And what happens is, eventually you start listening to the devil instead of listening to Jesus. Okay, now now you're already in a very bad place. Strongholds are part of the nature of the old man, but they're ingrained in us deeply. They're... They're how we think and how we move. They're, they are very much a part of us. It's the difference between somebody who will tell a lie and a compulsive liar. There's a difference between those two people. The compulsive liar can't help himself. He'll spin a yarn at the drop of a hat and then go home and go, why did I do that? I don't even know why I did that. There was no logical reason. I didn't even need to. The liar at least knows why he's lying. Friends, it's a fool's errand to try to hide your sin from God. You're not going to hide your sin from Him. He already knows. What I want you to know is that He paid a terrible price to purchase you at that auction. And because He was willing to do that, it should be clear to you that He loves you very much. And He very much wants you free. You don't need to struggle with, I wonder if God wants me free. He wouldn't have bought you if he did. He wouldn't have paid that price if he thought it was too much. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 says this, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Strongholds are not natural battles, and you can't fight them in the natural plane. That's why when you fight them in the natural plane, you lose every time. You can't fight them in the natural plane. They are spiritual battles, and they require spiritual weapons. That is the only way you win. Time's short, but I need to show you something about strongholds. I'll try to do this with some expedience. You'll find it in 2 Samuel 5, verse 6. You can turn there if you want to, or I'll just read it. I'm going to pause so many times through it. I don't want it to be confusing. This is the account of when David took the stronghold of Zion. It was a city that was ruled by the Jebusites. David came and he conquered the stronghold. And he took it and he would would call it the city of David. It would later become Jerusalem. Verse 6, the king, that's David, and his men marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites who lived there. And the Jebusites said to David, you will not get in here. You know, that's the same thing the enemy says to you in that secret area of your life. (laughs) You're not getting in here, Jesus. Well, surprise. Continuing, the Jebusites said this. They said, even the blind and the lame can ward you off. Do you understand? They thought that their stronghold was so secure, you don't even need an able-bodied man to keep people out. Just about any warm, breathing body could handle this one. They thought David cannot get in here. Verse 7, nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion, which is the city of David. That's, of course, the name he would give it. You should know that once a stronghold has been taken, the new master makes it his stronghold. Same thing in your life. In an area where the devil is ruling and shouldn't be, when Jesus comes, he will make that an area of his life. It will become his stronghold. 
It was a stronghold of the Jebusites. Now it's a stronghold of David, and he's going to build his house there. That's the same plan Jesus has. He's going to breach the walls of the stronghold that's in your life, and it'll become his stronghold. It'll become his place. Now, continuing in verse 8, I, I want you to pay attention because it's going to set the stage for events that are going to happen in the future. On that day, David had said, anyone who conquers the Jebusites will have to use the water shaft to reach those lame and blind who are David's enemies. Well, that's how, he, that's how they conquered it. They went up through the water shaft. Okay, continuing. That is why they say, now listen, the blind and the lame will not enter the palace. See, David, after conquering the place, and after they'd said, even a lime and a blame could keep you out, he said, you know what? They are not welcome in my palace. There, will, there won't be any blind or lame in my palace. It was, a, it was a working with what they had told him will keep you out. Now, fast forward a thousand years. Once again, the stronghold of Zion is going to be breached, but in a very different way. This time it's going to be David's son Jesus who is going to come. It's amazing to me. He'll come to the same city. He'll take the city captive. In fact, he will actually take captivity captive before he's done. But I love what he did in the process. He comes to Jerusalem. One of the first things he does, finds a blind man and he heals him. And he finds a lame man and he heals him. You find those in John 5 and John 9. If you have eyes to see it, it's a wonderful picture of him coming to set the captives free. Luke 4.18. It means all the captives, not just some of them, all the captives. Everyone caught in that stronghold. So he comes to the stronghold just like his forefather David does, and he takes it, but he does something a little bit different. Just a little bit different doesn't condemn the lame and the blind. In fact, he heals them. And in doing so, he makes clear the statement that he is overturning that law of his father. He's turning over that old saying that the lame and the blind would not be allowed in his palace. What he was saying is, I'm making a way for the lame and the blind to join me in my palace. I'm going to set them free from their affliction. And I will make a place for them. Guys, in a nutshell, this is the good news. This is the gospel of Jesus. The good news that he's made a way for you. You were bought with a price. Do you understand? You are no longer subject to those old taskmasters. I know they still speak. I know they still crack the whip. And I know they still expect you to respond. But you don't have to. Because they're not your master anymore. Jesus came to set you free. You must get this in your heart. You must understand. There's a reason that Paul wrote to the Romans that there's no condemnation anymore for those who are in Christ. You need to understand there is no condemnation. In failure, there's still no condemnation because he loves you. You think when my kids made a mistake, I said, oh, man, you never should have done that. Go find somewhere else to live. No, I love them. I love them in spite of the crazy things they did. I love them in spite of the hurtful things they did. And if they do more hurtful things, I'll still love them. Because they're my kids. There's no need for shame. He receives you just as you are. And whatever is broken in you, he will heal. You need to understand, he may not heal in the time you want to be healed. He will heal. Here's the problem. Adam and Eve, when this problem came to their life, they hid. They went and hid. Adam, where are you? I don't know why to see me naked. I, who told you you were naked? Clearly, something has happened. Friends, we need to come to him. Stop hiding from him. 
He, that area in your life, he's not going to go, when did this happen? Nobody told me. He knows. And he wants to set you free because he loves you. Paul says the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. They have divine power in the tearing down of strongholds. If there's something in your life that you just can't seem to be free from, there is a weapon that is outside the natural realm that will tear down the stronghold. But you're going to have to apply it. The greatest weapon I can offer you is the blood. Michael, why are you there? Do you understand the blood was not offered to any other of God's creation? No one else was given the blood. No angel, no demon. No one else has the ability to wield it or to apply it or to even use it. Only men. And it is powerful in the tearing down of strongholds. But here's the thing. You're going to have to come to him to get it. That means you have to come in your brokenness. You have to come. You have to come. Just as you are, you have to come and ask him. What I want you to understand is as as the spirit of Elijah begins to move and repentance begins to hit our land, it will. It'll hit the church first and, and it'll have different effects on different people. As these things begin to come, if a stronghold comes up in your life, don't run from him. Run to him. Run to him. If you're going, man, he's preaching to me this morning. Well, then you already know what it is. Run to him. Just run to him. Father, here it is. I, this, this is. I don't like this anymore. I don't want this anymore. And he will heal the nature that's in you. Because that's who he is. It's what he does. Jesus said this. He said, to him the Son sets free. The one whom the Son sets free. To him who the Son sets free is free indeed. I want you to know. He wants you to be free indeed. And he didn't pay a price so you could continue to be slave to anything else. So, don't deny the truth. Bring it to him. And ask him to clean you up. That's what he does. Father, help us today in Jesus' name. Father, for, for each of us, there are areas in our life that are just, well, Lord, they embarrass me before you. When compared to men, I look okay, but in your presence, I find myself embarrassed. Because there's areas in my life that clearly don't belong fully or wholly to you. Father, today I confess those areas. I don't want to be slave anymore. I don't want to jump. And that thing says jump. I don't want to be compelled. I want to be free. And you said the one whom the sun sets free would be free indeed. Father, I pray that over this congregation, Father, and all those who would hear this. Set us free, O oh God. We claim the blood. We call for the blood. Father, I pray you would apply it liberally to the strongholds in my life. And Father, to all who would say the same. Dissolve those areas. Remove those areas. Take them over and occupy them, Father, and make them your own stronghold. Make them your new home. We love you and submit to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you come, Chris? Friends, when we were his enemies, he purchased us. He saw us, he loved us. Knowing who we are, knowing who we would be. But he also knew this, he knew what would happen when we entered his gates. See, this moment he not only saw you as you were, but he sees you as you will be, as you yet cannot see yourself, because he's not bound in time. He sees you at the right hand. He sees you complete. He knows you make it. Sometimes it'd be good if we could see that too. On the night he was betrayed, 
Jesus took bread and He broke it and said, this is my body given for you. Thank you, Jesus. After the meal, He took the cup and He said, this is the blood of the new covenant. Let's receive it together. He said, my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. It is life. I would encourage you, in the coming weeks, lift up the gates. The King of glory may come in. There may be areas of your life you're just keeping the gates closed. Lift them up. Invite the King of glory to come in. We welcome you, Jesus. Come and set right all that's wrong and make me the man or the woman that you have called me to be. Hallelujah. The prayer team will be up here. I encourage you, if you've got sickness in your body or you just need a touch from the Lord, your anointed people, come and receive from the Lord. I'll be here if I caused you troubles. Otherwise, have an awesome week, huh?